all right um i hope you guys have uh, worked on experiment 8 and you're about to get done with experiment 8 report but experiment 8 is due tonight so 11 59 p.m uh several of you were uh, emailing me um, over the weekend to get things clarified. So I hope you guys made good progress on the on the report. Um, I, this is your last uh, deliverable for the semester. Um, so once you get done with experiment eight, you will not have um, any other uh, reports uh, to submit. Uh, the only thing remain which remains uh, is quiz three. So quiz three is going to be on, uh, well, it's going to essentially start on Tuesday uh, with the LMS portion, and it's going to go into Wednesday. Uh, so this is the written portion. So I want you guys to use your time efficiently. The, the Tuesday LMS portion, which, is, uh, which starts at 6 p.m. on the Tuesday of this week, uh, it's it's uh, as usual. It's not supposed to be uh, that difficult, so you guys should be able to work through that relatively uh, quickly. Um, and most people do uh, very well on that. Um, so I would encourage you guys to get done with the LMS portion uh, on Tuesday itself. Uh, it can uh, it will not only uh, secure your 20%, but it will also help you uh, prepare for the written portion on Wednesday. About the the uh, final exam, uh, we are having optional quiz X. And two weeks ago, uh, there was one full week where I um, asked for your uh, signups. So uh, about 20% of the class has signed up for quiz X and I will be uh, contacting them regarding the logistics for uh, Quiz X uh, sometime uh, early this week. Uh, so yes, it is going to happen Monday of next week. So it's in one week time, um, but uh, just so that it's going to be uh, a different set of logistics compared to Quiz 2 and Quiz 3. It is going to be timed, it is going to be proctored, um, and it's going to be close book, close notes. Um, so you will only be allowed to uh, use the crib sheets. So uh, slightly different compared to uh, the two quizzes that we have been having. Um, and the only reason is that it is uh, uh, replacing the lowest quiz score. Uh, and for some of you, it is the quiz one. So the, the logistics have to be similar to quiz, quiz one. Um, so to answer your question, there is a final exam. Uh, uh, for which we have, uh, uh, students have signed up. Okay, uh, let's see. The quiz three Tuesday we, we said that, and then of course we have Wednesday, which is from um, what is that? Eight a.m. to five p.m. And you guys work through this uh, just as you did for quiz two, um, and you submit your work on uh, grade scope. <clears throat> So next, uh, let us spend some time talking about, uh, let's see, we will do uh, topics of uh, quiz three. So there are essentially three experiments uh, that fall under this uh, quiz. Experiment six, seven, and eight. Um, so experiment six, experiment seven, and experiment eight. Uh, the only thing that I'm doing right now is just reminding you that the main topics, all of this information is available to you on the class website. So if you go into, uh, let's see, let me show you guys where to find all of this information and in uh, a lot of detail. 
Uh, so if you go to the class website, let's see here. Um, and if you go into information about quizzes, you click on quiz three, uh, you will, uh, at the beginning, you have all the back exams, um, starting from 2007, so several of them. Um, and then for each question, um, uh, what is going to be the topic and essentially uh, what aspect of that topic is going to be tested. So all of those things are laid out uh, in very, very good detail. Um, so, you know, take, take a look uh, at that uh, after the class, uh, but definitely before the exam. Um, and you, you don't need to read the entire thing. If you are, suppose if you are uh, comfortable with the 555 timers, um, you know how to use them, you know how to measure uh, certain voltages, then you can move on to uh, topic two and three and so on. So it depends on your comfort level, identify your strengths and weaknesses and uh, try to spend your time accordingly. So all of this information is available uh, anyway. I, I'm just recapping some uh, key topics uh, j just to serve as a, as a reminder. Uh, let's see. So for experiment six, uh, what did we do? We first started talking about transistors. So we, we talked about the NPN uh, transistor, the bipolar junction transistor, it being a three terminal device that you can use either for switching or as a current amplifier. Um, and you know, how are you going to go between those regions, the cutoff active and saturation region? Um, we took a look at some circuits in which we have a, uh, a transistor and we analyze those circuits uh, during lecture. So these lectures are on YouTube, uh, we, we recorded them. Uh, so depending on, again, your strengths and weaknesses, uh, if, if you feel a little bit unsure about a certain topic, please go back and uh, watch the uh, YouTube video uh, to get some um, a, a review. Oh, by the way, that reminds me, there is a review session uh, tomorrow. So let me just write that down as well. So James has uh, agreed to, uh, well, James has offered to uh, do a review session tomorrow. Um, many of you seem to uh, benefit from that. Uh, you indicated that to me uh, in the last class. So he's gonna be holding a review tomorrow. Uh, 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, and he has already sent out the webex uh, invitation links uh, on piazza so if you go and take a look at his uh, post uh, you will see a link there uh, which points you to his uh, uh, webex meeting location so uh, i would encourage you guys to attend the attend that uh, to uh, get some insight into uh, some uh, key topics all right let's come back to this uh, experiments. So we're talking about transistors. Uh, then what did we do next? Uh, let's see. We did uh, logic gates. But actually logic gates was essentially a part of that. With transistors, what we did was uh, talked about uh, switches how they relate to uh, transistors. And we talked about the circuit model of switches. Uh, we tried to uh, look at uh, some circuits in which we model a switch with a simple on off switch. And uh, how do we essentially implement logic gates by arranging switches in series and parallel and then we tied that topic to how do you build a NAND gate, an AND gate, an OR gate, and so on. Um, let's see, what else did we talk about in experiment six? Uh, oh, yes. Comparators and Schmidt triggers.
So in terms of switching, uh, those two uh, PAMP based uh, components are uh, very important and there's definitely going to be a question on uh, comparators and Schmidt triggers. So take a look at that. Those are essentially very interesting um, components uh, that uh, allow you to uh, sort of ignore or reject uh, uh, small uh, low amplitude noise, high frequency noise. Um, the Schmidt trigger uh, does that, the comparator doesn't. Uh, so a comparison uh, between a comparator and a Schmidt trigger uh, is definitely going to be there on the exam. Uh, let's see what's next on quiz, uh, sorry, experiment six. Uh, we talked about digital switching. So in digital switching, what I essentially mean is uh, using 7400 series ICs, such as 7404 and 7414. So this was the, uh, the inverter and the Schmidt trigger based inverter. And the pinouts of those 7400 series ICs were also discussed at that time. Uh, so are you able to take a look at uh, an input and be able to sketch the output for those circuits? Uh, the last thing that we talked about in experiment eight was a relay based circuit. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about relays specifically, uh, but as the, the, so essentially the last part is going to be switching, which we have covered in the previous topics under experiment six. Um, so relay, uh, don't worry about the, uh, so let me write that down in relay. Don't worry about that uh, for experiment six. All right, that's as far as experiment six is concerned. Let's move on to experiment seven. Uh, experiment seven was uh, very comprehensive, but it was all focused on digital logic. So we talked about um, De Morgan's law. We talked about um, combinational and sequential circuits. So things that have memory and things that do not have memory. If these terms uh, seem new to you, please, uh, uh, again, YouTube videos uh, that we recorded. Uh, combinational sequential logic circuits. Uh, we uh, specifically focused on JK flip-flop and counters. And we actually looked at the 74107 chip and 74393 chip uh, for the JK and the uh, JK flip-flop and the counters. Uh, we also talked about, uh, you know, the, the counters give you a four bit, uh, or an eight bit output. So how do you, uh, convert that, uh, to a decimal number to know what value it is. So all of these topics, uh, am I missing something here? Uh, let's see, JK flip flop. So logic gates was there, De Morgan's law was there. Um, oh, yes. Five, five, five timer. But we only looked at the A stable mode here. So functioning as a free running um, timer circuit. So how do you, uh, use the parameters of the timer R1, R2 and C1 to essentially generate a square wave of the desired frequency and duty cycle. Um, so we, th there is going to be a, a design problem, maybe a, on, on this, uh, the 555 timer. So I would take a look at uh, that uh, in, in good detail. Uh, and you know, they're, they're uh, very uh, good problems that are uh, on 555 timer on the on the back exams. Uh, I would encourage you guys to take a look uh, at those. Uh, let's see if I can point you to a certain uh, back exam problem. 
Um, and my my goal with these, uh, uh, my goal with showing you this problem is essentially it touches on a variety of questions that it could be asked uh, that relate to the 555 timer. So, for example, uh, the first part over here, essentially straight, you know, application of the formulas. And in class, remember, we derived these formulas in class. Uh, but the first one is relatively straightforward. Then you would use the numbers that you obtained in part A to sketch uh, the output of the timer in part B. But as you go down to part C and D, you can take a look at uh, the details. So you try to find out the maximum and minimum voltages on pin C, pin 6 and 7. So the pin 6 is your discharge pin. Uh, sorry, pin 6 is your threshold pin that you also connect to the trigger pin, which is pin 2. Uh, in the a stable mode and pin 7 is the discharge pin so how do you and you know i've, I've laid out the explanation uh, for all these calculations over here uh, and i would ask you to take a look at that um, and then follow uh, you know the last thing is sketching out those pin 6 and pin 7 voltages uh, so in my opinion this was uh, and then the last thing that we did was okay can you do some design can you do some changes to the circuit to obtain a different duty cycle uh, and what what could you do in that regard? Um, so take a look at this problem. This is from fall 2019, the last uh, uh, semester. Quiz 3, uh, and this is problem 1 of that. Uh, let's see here. Go back. Just come back here. And let's now talk about experiment 8. So this was very recent. Uh, so uh, lots of little components in experiment 8. Um, so let's uh, just write those down. Uh, we had the, the diodes, uh, 1 and 4148, the small signal diode, we have the Zener diode, uh, LEDs, phototransistor. Uh, let's see here. Uh, and applications. So I'm going to write that in bold because all of experiment eight was focused on how can you use a diode to do a half wave rectifier, full wave rectifier. Full wave rectifier, a limiter, voltage regulator, um, uh, to name a few. Um, and the key the key to all these you know the the magic key was the current voltage characteristic so if you if you if you know the current voltage characteristics if you understand that very well uh, you will be able to unlock any of those topics um, because that's that's kind of the foundation for answering all the other uh, aspects of experiment eight Okay, so uh, that's essentially a layout of the, the topics uh, that you should expect for uh, the quiz three that's coming up. Uh, let's see. If you guys have questions, uh, please, uh, please you, you ask them now uh, regarding quiz three topics. there is going to be an uh, a piece spice component to this so you will be asked to uh, do some uh, simulations um, and uh, the goal over there will be to essentially validate what you got in your numerical answers so uh, you know if you're if you're doing things on paper that may or may not be correct um, and one way to really know uh, whether you have done something correct or not is to validate that uh, by using uh, a simulation. So uh, for all the problems, it is a good idea. For specific problems, uh, you will be required uh, to use uh, capture piece bias. Um, and I hope that after uh, the, the change to remote learning, uh, you guys all have uh, become capture piece bias experts. Uh, so uh, that will be uh, a part of the exam, just as it was for quiz two.
So I'm waiting uh, for a moment here to see if you guys have any questions. Okay, so let's see. Uh, once we lay out the, the topics, I guess uh, the, the review will help you gain some uh, uh, some more details about this. And then, of course, the back exams are uh, there. Uh, all right, let's jump into project four. So project four, the title is Optical Communication Link. And essentially what we are doing is sending uh, a waveform, any arbitrary uh, user waveform a signal. Um, so an audio signal is what we are going to focus on. Oh, come on. So we are going to focus on audio signal. Um, and we are going to transmit that. First, we are going to encode that using light pulses. And we are going to transmit that optically and then uh, receive it using a photo uh, sensor. So we are going to use a photo transistor to receive that uh, information. And then uh, we can uh, do some processing of that. We can do some amplification. Uh, we can uh, do some uh, audio amplification and then play it on a speaker. So the, the goal is... Uh, the transmitter and the receiver should be absolutely disjoint. They should only be communicating via light. And let us see if we can uh, transmit and receive uh, an audio signal of our choice. And I have uh, uh, downloaded a few interesting songs and I'm hoping that you guys uh, will like them. Uh, if it plays, however, I don't know if it will work or not. Let we'll find out. Um, so, how do we encode this? So, essentially, we have uh, this first process is to encode your song uh, using light pulses. One way to do that is to use pulse width modulation or PWM. The idea is that if you have a high value on your input signal, then you can use a bigger width of the light pulse. So essentially keep the light on for a longer time, relatively, if you have a higher amplitude. And then if you, on the song, if you have a lower amplitude, then you encode that using a narrow width of the light pulse. So keeping it on for a shorter duration of time. And then of course, at the end, you have the amplitude increasing. So you have that pulse width uh, increasing. So these are, this is essentially the input song or the audio signal. And this is showing you how we can encode this uh, using pulse width modulation. So this is the light going on and off for a longer time or a, for a short duration. So this is what our photo transistor sees. It doesn't see this. So it sees this and it's going to convert that uh, to uh, something that can play on a speaker. So the encoding scheme that we are using is pulse width modulation for uh, the project four. You could use other schemes as well. Um, you could change uh, the frequency, the phase, uh, the amplitude. Uh, you can change a variety. Uh, of parameters of a pulse to modulate it. But here we are changing the width of the pulse. Um, and it works out uh, relatively well uh, because it's simple enough to put it on a circuit. So this is what, you, what it's going to look like. We are going to have a transmitter and that transmitter is essentially that over there. And then all of this is our receiver. 
and they are both disjoint they are only communicating through an led and a photo transistor um, and all these question marks are essentially the receiver design or the transmitter design that are used to uh, essentially process that signal so can i get uh, the the audio signal at point a uh, can i get a encoded um, pulse width modulated signal at point c so i'll have to use certain uh, components in uh, inside these blocks to get to that pulse width modulation uh, we are going to use a triple five timer to do that and then at point d you have the phototransistor then we'll have an op amp then we'll have an audio amp and then eventually we'll have a speaker uh, at the very end so those question marks are essentially uh, subsystems in our transmitter and receiver now our transmitter is figure three and if you scroll down a little bit you have the receiver um, so you know if you look at the number of components on the circuit this is uh, the the sort of the most complex circuit that uh, you have seen for EI um, on one particular uh, circuit board uh, the receiver you have uh, the op amp 741 chip you have the audio amps uh, LM386 chip uh, you have a bunch of resistors uh, phototransistor capacitors two power supplies, uh, two nine volt power supplies, um, potentiometers, a 10K potentiometer is over here, then there is a, a 100K potentiometer over there. So a lot of components. So I will essentially walk you through uh, some uh, key ideas because we are not gonna be spending time uh, working too much on project four, but it'll be helpful to just understand what's going on. Um, so right at the center of the transmitter, so and this is the transmitter, which is responsible to um, take an audio waveform that comes through the function generator. So what we are going to do is take a, our audio uh, signal and play it as a custom waveform through the wave gen, the yellow wire that is out of your analog discovery. And the first thing that we are going to do is use a capacitor to block the DC. So we are going to remove DC uh, so as to center it around uh, zero. And then that will be our control signal. So that will essentially be uh, going into one of the, the, the op amps that is inside the 555 timer. And so that's, a, that's the signal that we are sampling or modulating or encoding. And we are going to encode that using pulse width modulation based on the parameters over here. As we know, we can change the frequency and duty cycle of the 555 timer by changing R1, R2, and C1. In this case, our R1 is essentially a combination of a potentiometer, which is variable. So you can turn a knob to change the resistance between the two points those two points being, let me highlight those two points. So if I have point A over here and I have point B over there, I can change the resistance between those two points by essentially uh, changing the knob. So uh, it can go uh, between um, uh, two values, zero to 100K, uh, depending on where that knob is. R3 is a fixed resistor of one kilo ohm and the combination of those two uh, R pot and R1 is going to give us the first resistor. The second resistor is a fixed one R2 which is 27k and then we have a, a capacitor 0 0.001 microfarad capacitor that is essentially getting charged and discharged. As you can see the capacitor value is very very small um, and the, the, the potentiometer is can get very high so this is essentially uh, going to draw uh, small amounts of current from our power supply uh, in this case the power supply is a 5 volt power supply that is coming off of our analog discovery 
Um, so just to keep things separate for our transmitter, we have we are powering up our transmitter using analog discovery. We are powering up the um, receiver using the nine volt batteries that we have in our tools kit. Uh, so separate power supplies, separate grounds, everything separate. Okay, then it's truly optical communication. Um, let's see, we talked about the two resistors, R1, R2, and uh, the capacitor that gets charged and discharged. And then the input is uh, DC block is present, and then we are going to five. And the output, which is the going to be the pulse width modulated um, waveform, that is going to essentially go through the LED. And we have a current sensing resistor over there. Uh, of 100 ohms. The LED is essentially going to uh, blink at a very, very fast rate, uh, depending on the, the the two aspects. One is the amplitude of this function generator, which is being uh, encoded as the, uh, the width of the pulse. And then you have a capacitor over here that is essentially doing a bypass uh, function to the uh, source. So if there are any, uh, high frequency changes in the source, those are going to get shorted out. Um, so that's essentially our transmitter, pulse width modulation of uh, an audio signal. Um, next, we have a receiver. So in the receiver, the first thing that you do is see the, the light wave. So control is going into, um, let me see, can I? show you that or maybe I can show you that over here. So control is essentially an input to the threshold comparator. So earlier we were leaving the threshold uh, connected to just a capacitor to ground. We were not changing this particular threshold. Now we are connecting that to a, a voltage that is changing an audio signal. So essentially we are changing uh, what goes into our threshold comparator. And uh, depending on when those, uh, how that changes, we are going to look at an output waveform that is a pulse width modulated uh, version of whatever you, goes into pin five. But that also has to do with the external things, R1, R2, R3, uh, sorry, R1, R2 and C1 that you connect outside. So R1 included a fixed resistor and a potentiometer, R2 was fixed, C1 was a small 0 0.001 microfarad capacitor. So by looking at those, we can control the, the uh, how big uh, the, the width can be or how small can the width uh, be on the pulse uh, modulation. Okay, uh, let's see, if I go down here, I'm looking at the receiver design. So a lot of components, let's just uh, um, isolate some of the characteristics. So the first thing that needs to happen is the sensing. So because the last thing that happened in the transmitter is the transmission of light. So the first thing that we are going to do is to sense light using a phototransistor. Once we do that, we are going to remove DC using a, a DC block capacitor and then we are going to go into an op amp. The op amp essentially is configured in the um, inverting amplifier, right? Inverting amplifier with a gain of 22. So that's uh, your, so it's receiving the signal, doing a DC block, and then uh, amplifying the signal uh, by 20 times, 22 times, and it is inverting it. And then we have a potentiometer that can go to up to a value of 10K. When we turn that knob over here, we are going to take part of the signal that was amplified by the op amp and go into an audio amp. LM386 is an audio amplifier. So it takes the input or part of the input and um, uh, amplifies that into an audio signal uh, of a very, very high gain. Uh, and if you include this 10 microfarad capacitor, the gain uh, increases by another, I believe, 100 times. Um, and we can now uh, play it on a speaker. So 
photo detection or sensing, amplification, audio amplification, played on the speaker. So that's essentially what is going on. Um, one very, uh, uh, you know, key aspect of this design is how do you actually connect the two volt, uh, the two um, batteries, the, the, the voltage sources. So a lot of the students have difficulty uh, connecting the plus nine and the minus nine uh, batteries. So let me talk about that. Over here is the story is very simple, right? Because the, the red wire goes into all of that and then the black wire goes into all of that and the analog discovery takes care of uh, establishing the ground and give the uh, plus five uh, volts. But over here, we don't have um, that analog discovery uh, that we had earlier. Over here, we simply have uh, a, a nine volt uh, battery, a minus nine volt battery. So the question is, uh, how do we connect them? Well, do I need one or two? Well, I need two. So I need two nine volt batteries. And what you can do is you can essentially, uh, let me see if I can exaggerate this. For the nine volt battery, you will have two wires, two leads that come out of that. One is the red one, one is the black one. So for the top guy, so let's talk about this guy right here. For the top guy, you have two wires, red and black. The red one, essentially what you can do with the red one is connect it over there. The top rail of your proto board, you can make that red wire. So that's coming out of this guy. And then the black wire from that guy can go to the bottom rail. And let me highlight that as well. So if you think about the power rails of a proto board there will be a, a a rail at the top a rail at the bottom and you can use the first power supply 9 volts to establish the power and the ground rail so connect the red wire to that guy connect the black wire to that guy as far as the 9 volt plus 9 volt battery is concerned now you have another 9 volt battery here which also has red and black wires. So the difference is because it's nine volts, it is essentially the reverse. So the red of this goes to this rail and the black of that goes to that rail. So that's how you um, connect your uh, two power supplies. The, uh, the 330 microfarad capacitor is essentially functioning to protect the circuit from any high frequency element. So we know that um, uh, the, the 330 or a capacitor is going to function as a low impedance component for high frequencies because the impedance is inversely proportional to the frequency. So if there are any things that are changing very, very quickly, it's going to shut them out. Uh, so you don't want to hear any uncomfortable uh, noise on your speaker, even though it might still happen, but uh, to some extent you can uh, remove that and not allow it to go to the speaker. Okay, so that's essentially it. Um, I think uh, we can um, go on to taking a look at uh, how um, it looks, um, how it functions. Um, so if you guys can bear with me for a moment, I will uh, put that up.
actually let me stop the recording here uh